Well, welcome to this professional development activity entitled Zika Virus and Public Health in the Pacific, What You Need to Know for Public Health Practitioners. My name is uh, Professor Brian Mangum. I'm a consultant epidemiologist working here in the Pacific. Um, one of my particular areas of interest is emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, so I have a particular love for things like Zika virus and chikungunya and leptospirosis and so on and so forth. I am also an assistant professor of epidemiology and biostatistics within the College of Medicine, Nursing, and Health Sciences at Fiji National University. And for the next three or so years, I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology and public health at the College of Micronesia FSM, where I've been seconded through a grant with the Pacific Island Health Officers Association and the University of Arizona to provide activities just like this. So what we're going to do today is this is specifically tailored towards public health practitioners here in the Pacific, but also to uh, medical and allied health practitioners such as nursing, laboratory science, and so on and so forth. And the goal today is to give you some background and an introduction to the uh, Zika virus, considering that it is a hot topic in the news as it spreads rapidly across the globe, and to give you some background in terms of what you need to know in terms of prevention and public health practice. So let's go ahead and jump right in. All right, so some background here really quick. So Zika virus is a mosquito-borne flavivirus, okay? That's the family of viruses that it comes from. And it's closely related to the dengue virus, which is also a flavivirus. Now, Zika was first isolated from a rhesus monkey in the uh, Zika forest of Uganda in 1947, hence the uh, name Zika because of the name of the forest from which it was isolated. And it was first isolated in Aedes africanus, that's the type of mosquito, in the same forest in 1948, and then it was isolated in humans in Nigeria in 1954. So you can see it made a zoonotic jump fairly rapidly from being found in the rhesus monkeys in 1947, jumping over into the human population by 1954. Now, that's not to say that it didn't exist in human populations before that, and in fact, there's a good chance that it did as a zoonotic, and it simply had not been identified and recognized, or, or more likely it hadn't been differentiated from some of the other um, uh, fever-borne Ill illnesses, such as yellow fever, dengue fever, and so on and so forth, up until that 1954 case in Nigeria. Now, since uh, it was first identified and isolated in humans in the 1950s in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Zika virus has become endemic in many parts of Africa and as well as Asia. Now, here in the Pacific, and in particular the South Pacific, it was first identified after an outbreak in the Yap Islands of the Federated States of Micronesia back in 2007. All right, let's talk a little bit about how Zika virus is transmitted. And you notice I'm keeping this kind of low-key for public health practitioners uh, since we don't want to necessarily go into the biology of it at this time. Okay. Now, in terms of transmission, uh, Zika virus is primarily going to be transmitted to humans through bites from the Aedes mosquitoes. Now, there are a number of different Aedes mosquitoes within the Aedes family, but we'll get into uh, the specifics of which type of Aedes mosquito transmit it, transmits the uh, virus more prevalently in the Pacific versus elsewhere later in the, in the, uh, in the lecture. Okay. Now, the thing about the Aedes mosquitoes is they're oftentimes going to live around buildings, and they're oftentimes going to live in urban areas, and they're usually going to be active during the daylight hours. And their peak biting activity, in other words, when they're going to be um, most likely to come along and uh, have that viremic blood meal that we talk about in epidemiology, their uh, peak biting activity is going to occur in the early mornings and then in the late afternoons. So that obviously is going to play a role in prevention that we'll talk about a little bit later. Now there's some evidence that suggests that Zika virus can also be transmitted to humans through blood transfusion as well as uh, perinatally, all right, so within the uh, womb and uh, during uh, the birthing process. And then there's also some evidence to suggest that it can be transmitted sexually as well. However, I do want to point out that these modes of transmission are relatively rare, and from a strict public health standpoint, it's probably best to think about this in terms of simply being transmitted to the 80s, uh, 80s mosquitoes, such as uh, we would find with dengue and some of the other vector-borne illnesses that we so frequently deal with here in the Pacific. Okay. 
Now the incubation period is going to be about two to seven days. So when I say incubation period, I simply mean the amount of time between which the uh, mosquito bites, okay, and uh, which time the person is going to start to show symptomologies of being infected with the uh, Zika virus. Okay, so what do you need to know in terms of the signs and symptoms? Now, Zika virus infection is going to be characterized primarily by a low-grade fever. Now, when I say low-grade fever, I say usually that's going to be less than about 38.5 degrees Celsius. Now, it's frequently going to be accompanied by um, what we call a maculopapular rash. And when I say a maculopapular rash, I simply mean it's flat and it's red, okay? Now, this can be a diffuse rash. Um, if you look at the pictures, usually what you're going to see is you're going to see it on the back and then on the trunk of the individual, okay? But in terms of the practicality of using the uh, maculopapular rash for uh, diagnostic purposes, keep in mind that just as in uh, cases with dengue and uh, leptospirosis and other of our tropical illnesses where we're going to see a rash, that can oftentimes be difficult to identify in individuals who are uh, darker skinned. Okay. So some of the other common symptoms that we can see are going to include muscle pain. Okay, Also going to see some joint pain, and there's possibly going to be swelling, notably in the uh, small joints of the hands and the feet. We're also going to see um, headache, or and then we're going to see pain behind the eyes. Uh, when we see pain behind the eyes, we describe that as retroorbital pain, and we also can see conjunctivitis in the eyes. Now, I want you to particularly note that these are all similar symptoms to dengue fever, so it's not surprising that sometimes um, Zika might have been misdiagnosed in the past. So in terms of our medical practitioners that may, may be listening, it's important that you be able to differentiate uh, a person who is presenting with Zika virus versus to somebody who's presenting with dengue. Now, we'll talk about how we do that later, but the, the point is, and just in terms of the history and the physical of the individual, that's going to be difficult to do, and so we'll actually have to rely upon laboratory diagnosis, and that's usually going to be laboratory diagnosis using some type of nucleic acid um, amplification technique. Now, I do want to point out that the symptoms are generally going to be mild, okay, and they'll be what we would describe as flu-like, okay, and the infection tends to go unrecognized or even misdiagnosed as dengue, like we've mentioned before, and like I said, because it tends to be very mild and very flu-like, a significant number of cases are simply going to go uh, without being presenting into the medical system, and hence they're not going to present into the epidemiological surveillance system that most of our countries around the Pacific have. Now, with these asymptomatic infections, <clears throat> and indeed with most of the majority of the infections that we're going to see with Zika virus, most people are going to make a rapid recovery, they're not going to have difficulty, uh, and they're going to be able to return to full function. Now, keep in mind that's going to be our populations that have an intact immunological system. So anybody that is, uh, has reduced immunological status, such as cancer patients, um, chronic disease patients, uh, such as type 2 diabetes, older patients, and in particular young children, okay, those individuals are at increased risk for having a significant morbidity associated with the Zika virus and are more likely to be the individuals that are going to be admitted into the healthcare system. Okay, but in terms of just uh, general public health applications, most of your patients are going to see a, a quick, uneventful recovery. Now, along those lines of most people being able to uh, fully recover, as of this date, and it's the uh, 7th of February 2016, there actually have been three deaths from a Zika virus, but these occurred in Colombia, so this was in uh, South America, the northern tip of South America there, and um, it's important to point out that these deaths were uh, associated with a rare nerve disorder, okay, so it's very uncommon at this time, and I, I, I add that caveat, at this time, because things can change, it's going to be very uncommon common to see people actually dying from Zika virus. And I base that upon, you know, we've, we have had past outbreaks in the uh, Pacific as well, such as Yap and in uh, New Caledonia and French Polynesia as well. And so that's based upon past performance of the disease. But as you know, things can actually change. 
Now, in terms of diagnosis, okay, several methods can actually be used to diagnose Zika virus. Now, in terms of just the uh, plain history uh, and the physical of the patient and the pre uh, presenting signs and symptoms, I've already pointed out that it's going to be very difficult just along those lines alone to differentiate this from a uh, dengue case. Okay, So we have to turn to laboratory diagnosis. And there's a couple of different techniques that can be used uh, without going into too many details here. We can use uh, what we call viral nucleic acid detection. We can also use virus isolation, okay, and we can use uh, serology as well, and I'll make a note about serology here in just a moment. Now, nucleic acid detection by what we call reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction is going to be the primary means of diagnosis, okay, and it's important to note that most of your uh, clinical laboratories that you have out there probably don't have the capacity to do this. So it's something that um, if you suspect uh, Zika virus, then you probably are going to have to um, send that to one of the other laboratories on the mainland or even in Australia or maybe one of the WHO funded laboratories to get a conf uh, confirmation diagnosis. Okay. Now we can use saliva or urine samples and as long as those urine samples and those saliva samples have been collected during the first three to five days after the onset of symptoms. Okay, that's important to remember. Or we can use um, serum. In other words, we can use uh, blood products that are collected in the first one to three days, and those would be suitable for detection of Zika virus. Now, we do have the ability to do some serology testing, and serology is something that can be done uh, generally within your local laboratories, and this is going to include things like immunofluorescence assays, as well as enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, known as ELISA, okay? And they're going to be able to indicate the presence of what we call anti-Zika virus immunoglobulin M as well as immunoglobulin G antibodies. Okay, It can detect their presence, but I want to point out caution needs to be taken with these serological results. Okay, And the reason I tell you this as public health professionals okay, is because you need to understand that the data that may be being gathered during an outbreak, assuming Zika were to come to the Pacific, needs to go into some type of a surveillance system. So we need to make sure that the data of the number of cases cases we have going into a surveillance system is accurate. Serology isn't necessarily always going to be accurate with the identification of these anti-Zika um, immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin N M antibodies. And the reason for that is that um, especially with the immunoglobulin M, you might have cross-reactivity with other flaviviruses, okay, that have been, that the patient has come in contact with in the past. So in other words, if I have a patient who is, um, shows up with um, anti-immunoglobulin M, um, anti-Zika virus immunoglobulin M antibodies, okay, it's possible that what I have here is not a current active case of Zika virus. Maybe what I actually have is I have a patient who has been exposed to dengue in the past. Okay. So it's important that any suspected cases, um, if it's run through serology, that some type of laboratory-based uh, diagnosis using nucleic acid amplification is used for confirmation, especially if those cases are going to enter into a surveillance system. And that's especially important here in the Pacific, given the, uh, uh, the presence of things like dengue in the population, and in particular given the fact that uh, the population of the Pacific, despite the fact that we're such a huge area geographically, we do have a significant amount of travel among the islands. So an individual such as myself, who has worked in uh, the Solomon Islands and actually acquired uh, dengue in the Solomon Islands in 2012, in theory, I could test positive with an immunoglobulin M antibody here in the Federated States of Micronesia, and I could be misclassified as actually having Zika virus. Okay, So that becomes an issue that we need to be concerned with from a public health standpoint. In terms of treatment, there is uh, no commercial vaccines and there's no specific antiviral drug treatments for Zika virus infection. So treatment is actually directed primarily at uh, relieving symptoms using analgesic drugs and what we call antipyretics or drugs that would uh, be used to reduce fevers. Okay, so from a public health standpoint, obviously we're going to be very concerned with this issue of uh, prevention and control if Zika virus comes to our country. So it's important to keep in mind that the proximity of mosquito vector breeding sites to human habitation is actually going to be the significant risk factor for a Zika virus infection. 
Okay. Now, prevention and control relies on reducing the breeding of mosquitoes through source reduction. Now, when I say source reduction, I mean removal and modification of breeding sites, as well as reducing um, contact between mosquitoes and people. So how do we do this? Well, this can be achieved by reducing the number of natural and artificial water-filled habitats that are going to support the mosquito larvae. We can also achieve this by reducing the adult mosquito population around at-risk communities and by using barriers such as, oh, simple things like repellents, insect screens, closed doors and windows, as well as long clothing. Now, recall that um, Aedes is going to be the primary, vec the primary vector here. Now, since the Aedes mosquito is going to be a day-biting mosquito, now I did say it's primarily in the early morning and the early evening, but it can be really at any time during the day. And the reason it's early morning and early evening is that's when they're most active. But that doesn't mean that there isn't the possibility of being bit by an infected Aedes mosquito during the day, Okay, because there is. So since the Aedes mosquitoes are day-biting mosquitoes, it really is recommended that those who sleep during the daytime, and so this would be like young children, um, the elderly, sick people, all right, and so on and so forth, that these individuals should use insecticide-treated mosquito nets to provide them while they're asleep, okay? Um, the other thing that we can talk about is that mosquito coils and other insecticide vaporizers actually can be used to reduce the likelihood of biting as well. So what about during an outbreak? Well, during an outbreak, we need to be concerned with spraying of insecticides, okay, that need to be carried out periodically by communities and in particular by government to kill flying mosquitoes, okay. And of course, there are suitable insecticides that need to be used as uh, to kill the larvae, all right, during their growth period and to treat relatively large water containers, okay. And there is actually a World Health Organization pesticide evaluation scheme that is available to identify which of those insecticides would be best. And of course, we need to just be concerned with basic precautions for protection from mosquito bites, okay, especially by individuals that might be traveling into a high risk or endemic areas. And this would include simple things like the use of repellents, um, wearing light colored, I say light colored mosquitoes tend to be attracted to dark colored things. So saying, uh, so wearing light colored long sleeve shirts and pants, and also ensuring that um, houses are fitted with screens to prevent the mosquitoes from entering. Okay. Now that's not always possible among our populations. Not everybody has the money to ensure that their uh, home has appropriate mosquito uh, uh, screens on the windows and so on and so forth. And so that's something that needs to come back to a development issue in terms of looking at the uh, burden of vector-borne diseases in the Pacific and can countries and agencies become more involved in ensuring that basic barrier protection is available in populations. Now, as you know, okay, if you've been watching the news, Zika is spreading rapidly throughout the Americas, okay? Uh, it's entered into the United States. None of those who are currently being diagnosed in the United States are primary cases. They're all individuals that were bitten and... Um, and became infected overseas before traveling back to the United States, okay? But here in the Pacific, all right, it's important to know that uh, Zika is not necessarily a new thing here in the Pacific. It was first, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, it was first identified in Yap in 2007, and there were actually about 100 confirmed and probable suspected cases that came out of that, and they were primarily characterized by the conjunctivitis and the joint pain and then they were also able to identify that the uh, rash was a significant presenting symptom, or excuse me, a significant presenting sign during that 2007 YAP outbreak. All right. Uh, then again, it resurfaced in uh, French Polynesia in October 2013, and it affected about 11% of that total population there. And that particular outbreak actually spread to other Pacific islands, including New Caledonia, the Cook Islands, as well as Easter Islands, uh, the Easter Islands. Okay. Now, as most cases of Zika virus infection present with mild illness similar to other circulating virus infections that we see in the population, and because there was actually limited laboratory capacity during the outbreaks, um, it's likely that many, many more cases, as we discussed earlier, actually went unidentified in both the uh, YAP and the uh, French Polynesia outbreak as well. Okay. Now, 
It's important to note that as of this date, and like I said, it's the 7th of February 2016, um, we have seen cases in Australia, American Samoa, Samoa, or Western Samoa, as well as Tonga. Okay, um, There is some discussion in the past as to whether or not it was actually identified in Fiji, but I can't find any sources stating whether or not there's actually been cases identified in the, F in, in the Fiji Islands in the past. Okay. So like I said, just keep in mind that many of the cases um, in the outbreak here in the Pacific and uh, in the past outbreaks, that is, and in any potential future outbreak in the Pacific tend, may be subclinical because, like I said, the patients may not present, the patients may not be diagnosed, or they actually may be misdiagnosed. Now I want you to keep in mind that both Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus okay, have been implicated in large outbreaks of Zika virus in the past. Now Aedes aegypti is, uh, tends to be confined to tropical as well as subtropical regions, whereas Aedes albopictus can be found in tropical, subtropical, and actually temperate climates as well. Now, Aedes albopictus is actually spread from Asia and became established in areas of the South Pacific, as well as areas of Africa, Europe, and the Americas in recent decade. And that was actually seen... Um, it was actually seen primarily in uh, Southeast Asia. Now here in the South Pacific we have what we call Aedes henseli, okay, and it was actually Aedes henseli that was implicated in the uh, spread of Zika virus on the Yap Island in the Federated States of Micronesia and in 2007. And then it was actually Aedes polynesianus, okay, which was suspected to spread Zika virus in uh, French Polynesia in 2013. Now what's interesting to note about uh, Polynesius as well as um, Henseli, okay, is that neither of these endemic species had actually been recognized as a Zika virus before that time. And what that indicates is that, um, that this really is an emerging disease and that as it spreads to uh, unaffected countries that potentially exist for other endemic AD species to play a role in transmission as well. And that's certainly something that we need to be aware of here in the South Pacific as we've seen in the past with cases of uh, dengue, for example. Now, quick, uh, quick overview here of uh, the different uh, members of the family of Aedes. Now, Aedes aegypti is actually closely associated with human environments, and they tend to have the ability to breed indoors. And so that would be things like flower vases, concrete water tanks, bathrooms, and so on and so forth, and in artificial outdoor uh, settings. And like I said, p please keep in mind what I said, artificial outdoor settings. And this would be like vehicle tires, water storage vessels, discarded containers, and so on and so forth. Now, Aedes albopictus thrives in a wide range of uh, water-filled breeding sites. In fact, it's, it, it can... Uh, uh, it can thrive in more sites than Aedes aegypti, and this includes things like coconut husks, um, cocoa pods, bamboo stumps, tree holes, as well as rock pools, in addition to artificial containers such as the typical things like vehicle tires and plant pot saucers. And it's important to keep in mind that the diversity of habitats um, explains the abundance of Aedes albopictus in rural as well as in urban areas, as well as uh, shady city parks as well. Okay. Uh, finally, we have Aedes henseli, and it tends to breed in coconut shells, tins, plastic containers, vehicle tires, tree holes, and can in, uh, breed in the bottoms of canoes as well as metal, metal drums and so on and so forth. And then uh, Aedes polynesianus uh, tends to breed in things like tree holes and coconut shells as well as crab holes as well. So as you can see, a uh, wide variety of different settings in which um, Aedes uh, mosquito family can breed, making it an ideal vector uh, for carrying the disease across the Pacific since we have both urban, peri-urban, and uh, rural areas in which uh, the mosquito, different types of Aedes mosquitoes can breed and transmit. Okay, so let's do a quick little review to some of the key facts that I want you to uh, keep in mind in terms of your knowledge of Zika virus as a public health practitioner. Do keep in mind that Zika virus is transmitted to humans by infected mosquitoes, okay, and it's going to cause mild fever and rash, and other symptoms that might be present would include the muscle pain, joint pain, headache, pain behind the eyes, as well as conjunctivitis. Uh, Zika virus, remember, it's usually going to be a mild disease, and it's going to have symptoms that last only a few days. And once again, we would describe it as a mild flu-like illness. Okay. 
the disease has similar clinical signs to dengue, and as we've discussed a couple of times, keep that in mind because it can be misdiagnosed in areas where dengue is common or endemic. Okay. There's no cure for Zika virus, and so we focus our treatment on relieving symptoms such as reducing fever and uh, relieving muscle pain. And prevention and control relies on issues like reducing the breeding sites of Aedes mosquitoes and minimizing contact between mosquito vectors and people by using uh, barriers. Uh, barriers would include things like repellents and insect screens. Um, we also work to uh, reduce the um, incidence of, of Zika by reducing water-filled habitats supporting mis uh, that would support mosquito larvae in and close to dwellings and also reducing the adult mosquito population around at-risk communities as well. All things that you as a public health practitioner can help educate the public to do and things that for those of you who are involved in more of the environmental sciences that you can be directly involved in the control of these mosquitoes. So there you have it. You've made it through another one of my uh, CPT lectures. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, do keep in mind that this lecture is current as of the uh, 7th of February, and obviously these, this is an evolving situation, and so some of the numbers are going to change potentially, especially those revolving around uh, possible deaths from Zika and so on and so forth. So stay abreast of that. And I do want to point out, as with any of my YouTube continuous professional development lectures, if you will send me an email stating that you have watched the lecture, I am happy to provide you a handsome, suitable for framing certificate of completion that you can use with your local human resources department, or you can use for continuing education, continuing nursing, continuing medical credits, and so on and so forth. All you have to do is get in touch with me, and my email is brian, B-R-I-A-N, dot mangum, M-A-N-G-U-M, like a man chewing gum, at F-N-U dot A-C dot F-J. And as always, thank you for watching, and have a fabulous day.